Hello, everyone logging in. Um, we're just going to wait for all the attendees to get into this webinar, and then we're going to get started. So while you're waiting, just have a look around the screen. Just have a look, kind of fill out the poll, get to know all the features, figure out how to, that you can see all the bits on the screen, all that kind of stuff. Um, and in about three or four minutes, once we've got a few people, so this class is booked for uh, hopefully about 300 people today. So we'll see how many make it through. Um, and once we've got a few more people, we'll get started. Amazing. So while I'm waiting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a coffee because that, that's what you're here to see. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to try and get 19 grams of coffee into my basket. So give it a tap. Here I'm just tapping it, just trying to level out my coffee in the basket. Here you can see I've got a massive pile of coffee. Many would argue too much, um, and those people would be arguing for the wrong cause. Uh, so this will be around, I would say, 20 grams using my patented hand weighing method. Um, so how are we going to reduce this down to the 19 grams I want? First, I'm going to give it a tamp. So I've got my tamper here, put my fingers to the edge and push down just so it's all level. Give it a little spin just to make sure it's nice and flat. And then this bit, a lot of people miss whenever they're unboxing their machines. You grab your, you grab your razor tool, put it onto the top, give it a spin. And you can see here, I've got a, lot, a bunch of coffee left over. So that will be around about two grams of coffee. And it means now, if I give it another little tamp, I'll be closer to my 19 grams. In fact, the razor should give you, with pretty much all varietals of coffee, all density, all freshness, you'll get around about 19 grams every single time. So we've got perfectly tamped. Pop it into my porter filter, pull it across, press extract. Here you can see it's pre-infusing at a low pressure, and then it'll go up to nine bars of pressure. My machine's set to 93 degrees, um, which is the, is the preset for all machines. So we won't be changing that today. Um, you can see I've got a really nice steady flow for my extraction. And I'm looking for an extraction in around about 25 to 35 seconds um, for my 19 grams. And I want to get from my 90 grams of coffee, I want around about 40 milliliters of coffee. So there we go, 23 seconds. But we're gonna, that's the point of this class. We're gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to get a little bit better. I'm also gonna just do some milk. So one of the incredible features of this machine and all Sage machines is that they can do perfectly foamed microfoam, the same as you get in a coffee shop. So turn on my steam just to purge it out. That's just getting rid of any, any steam, any bubbles, any stuff like that. And then lift up my steam wand and turn it on. And I've got the tip just on the surface. It should hit, it should sound like constantly tearing papers, the best description I've heard. And then I'm keeping my hand on the side to gauge its temperature. I'm waiting until it increases in volume by about a third. And then once I've done that, I'm going to put it all the way in and just get it up to temperature. And the temperature I'm looking for is too hot to touch, which you may think is arbitrary, um, but it isn't. Your hand will always be too hot to touch around 55 degrees. Once it gets there, which is now, I'm going to wait one, two, three, and that should hit 65. For anyone at home who's got temp control jugs, try it out. Um, you know, put in the, in the Q&A if you think I'm wrong. I, I'll definitely listen if I am. And then for our pour, so we're gonna, again, we're gonna do all this again, but I'm gonna pour from starting up at height, moving it around to create my canvas. And then just as it gets to here, I'm gonna go down really close and flick forward. And there you've got a perfect coffee, exactly as I pay for in a coffee shop. Um, and one I'd be happy to pay for. And even better, I got it just for the cost of the beans and the milk at home. So I think we've got on around about 100 people. So we're gonna get started. Firstly, to introduce myself. Hello, I'm Luke um, from Sage Appliances. Firstly, to apologize, I actually cut my own hair uh, thanks to another online masterclass. So we're all learning different skills in this, in this odd time. Um, so firstly, I'd like you to have a look around the screen. So check out on the bottom, you've got your Q&A. You've also got a chat where you can, you can chat to various members of, uh, we've got a moderator online who's, who's called Tom. So I've actually worked for Sage for like about seven months. But fortunately for you guys, before that, I worked in coffee for 12 years. So I worked for commercial roasters. I ran a chain of coffee shops. I opened up a brew bar. 
uh, should have since the start of speciality coffee, which was about 15 years ago in the UK. I was pretty close to the start of it. Um, and I've obviously seen those changes and hopefully I should be able to give you incredible insight that works on any machine, but in this case, it will be on Sage machines. So all the stuff we go through today should work on any of the Sage machines specifically, and any machine that can achieve the same characteristics as a commercial coffee machine, which is one of the benefits of Sage. So they'll have nine bars of pressure, 93 degrees of temperature, uh, microfilming of milk, and they can have 19 to 20 grams in the basket, depending on the, on the heating system. So all of those things, as long as your machine has those, the ability to do that, um, everything I teach you today will be 100% relevant. Um, for, so this, unfortunately, Zoom webinar isn't uh, rewindable. We will be posting this to our YouTube at a later date, um, but mostly I'll try and do it with enough iterations that you can follow along at home. Um, and obviously, if you have questions, if you have queries, post them into the Q&A. So we've canceled the chat um, just for the simple reason that it's sometimes distracting. Um, I would recommend for the 45 minutes you'll be with me to concentrate as much as possible on what, what I'm doing, which sounds a little bit big headed. But honestly, um, we should go through everything and anything we miss, you can ask questions at the end. So you can ask Q&A throughout. And uh, my incredible moderator, Tom, who's worked for Sage for six years and probably has a better knowledge of Sage machines than me. I wouldn't like to admit it, but that is probably the case. Um, he's, he's online now. So if, Tom, do you want to say hi? Afternoon, everyone. So Tom's standing by with a big list of answers uh, who's just there to help. He also has the same machine at home. So his, his, his answers mean that we can get loads more information out at the same time. Um, but most of the stuff we go through will, will be gone through in, in the video aspect. So, without further ado, let's get started. Unless, Tom, you've got anything to add? Uh, no, the only thing that I was going to say was, um, I know you mentioned, uh, we, I think we're going to talk about the coffee you're using, but I have popped in the chat um, just a link, a link to it should anyone want to go and have a look later on. For sure. So, yeah, I, I love notes, and I've worked with them for a while now. Um, they've offered a 25% discount to anyone using Sage Masterclass's code, uh, and the coffee my enamorment with this coffee it's one of the sweetest coffees i've ever tried it's absolutely incredible and it also is for a really good cause so have a check after the video uh, if you're if you're really looking out for some coffee i think they'll also deliver next day delivery for tomorrow so give it a check so to get started the first section is violin the second section will be latte art and, and latte like texturing and then the final section will be talking about coffee as a more general term and what is speciality what is third wave so let's get started with dialing. Dialing is a term that refers to changing the various parameters on your machine, which in this case, and in the case of all of our machines, is the amount it grinds for, so the grind amount, and the grind size. So grind amount in, on my machine, which is a Bristol Pro, is in seconds, but on all the machines, the grind amount is just the amount of time it grinds for. The longer you grind for, the more coffee you have, the less time you grind for, the less coffee you have. Um, it also is relatable as it has a linear um, correlation to the grind size. So grind size is just referring to the distance between the two blades. So in here, you may have seen when you bought it, it's got stainless steel conical burr great blades. Those are just two blades. And the further they are apart, the coarser your coffee is, the closer they are, the finer it is. And the best way to think of this is like pebbles and sand is the common go-to. So if you think of pebbles, you put water over them, it will rush through really quickly. So the, the coarser you go, the quicker your shot will go. And then if you make it finer, it will be like sand. So it will take a longer time for that water to pass through. Um, and the, we'll be working to a recipe. So the same as if you're doing anything in food. If you know what you've done, it will be very easy to replicate this again. So think of like a cake. If you just throw in some flour, throw in some sugar, you'll probably get varying results every single time. And those people who are best at baking and best at, in fact, all levels of cooking, it will be that they have an idea of the consistency and the different features and attributes of the bits they put in so that they can then change them, but also keep the ones that need to stay the same, the same throughout. So first, we're going to try and grind 19 grams of coffee. Um, I would recommend to adhere to a recipe on all Sage machines of 19 grams. And in fact, any system that has um, the heating system this does, uh, this is due to you want a lot of coffee. 
um, all home espresso machines, because they in this case aren't running to a dual boiler, they need a little bit more coffee so you can, you've got a better chance of extracting more flavor. Because all of these can create exceptional espresso, and that's just a little tip. You need to have at least 19 grams in your basket before, uh, before you'll be able to get really good results. So I'm gonna give it a tap. I've got my settings at 13 seconds of grind and grind size seven. So I'm gonna give it a tap and just start grinding. So the settings I tell you now are not things that you'll want to just copy. So these settings are different for every single machine and every single copy. So this process of dialing, you'll want to do over and over. You'll want to do this one whenever you get a new coffee, but also whenever you have significant changes to your coffee. So if you've left your coffee in your hopper for a week, you'll probably want to make tiny changes to get it back to be really good tasting. Uh, but this process, if you, if you use the same blend every single time, this should be sort of a once off thing and then make little changes to get better and better. So here you can see I've got a big mound of coffee. That's right, don't be worried about it. Um, I tapped it so I didn't have too much waste, but don't worry too much about waste. I can really simply just wipe this off and all of a sudden it's clean again. So what I'm gonna do is tap it on the side. And what this does is it turns that really big pile into a more manageable pile. So when I tamp it, it doesn't fall over the edges. So give it a tap. I'm then gonna get my tamper. So this is my tamper. I'm gonna put it onto the top. And this is probably a really, well, this is a really good tip. Um, in terms of pressure, I can't really Hello, Tom, can you still hear me? We can now. We, we lost you just for a moment. <laughs> Perfect. So I just got a call, <laughs> which is great. So sorry. Um, so tamping. Here's my water filter. Here's my tamper. I'm going to put it down and push with my fingers to the edge. So what I was saying about pressure, the amount of pressure I can exert on the coffee, although everyone will tell you it's, it should be 20, 15 to 20 kilograms, there's no way you can know how much pressure you're pushing with. So I would just say push as hard as you can. And don't worry too much about the pressure at which you push. The thing that should really be important, and it's far more important, is whether or not it's level when you tamp it. So what I'm doing is I'm putting it onto a flat surface, or you can put it like this onto a corner, and you push down with your fingers to the edge. So if you look, my fingers are touching the edge, and it means whenever I push, I can feel really, really obviously whether or not it's level. So being level is far more important. Um, best way to think about this is, well, water's super lazy. It will take the, the shortest route through any, any bed of coffee. So if you've got a, a bed depth that's sort of really wonky, it will fare through the bit that's thin and you won't extract any from the bit that's thick. So from your 19 grams of coffee, you'll extract maybe five or six grams of that flavor. And what you want to do is extract, well, 19 grams of flavor, as much flavor as you can get out of it. Um, so here we're going to push down, make sure it's level. And now's the next bit. So you'll notice I haven't got a scales out and I would actually recommend when starting not to use the scale. Um, just for the simple reason, the purpose of a scale is to set your dose. So the, when you're using a scale, it's so you can follow a recipe. The razor, which comes with every machine, all this does is means you'll get 19 grams. And if that's the purpose of the scale, which you have to tear, you have to sort of get out, and every single time it's kind of different, unless you're using really different and, and, and weird recipes, if you're just looking for 19 grams and then to change your dial, like your grind size to get closer to how you like to taste your coffee, it'll be a lot easier to use a razor than it will be to use a, a scale. So here I've used the razor, I've leveled it off. I'm gonna give it another tamp just to make sure it's really flat. And then what I'm doing now, I'm gonna try and not knock this. So I, this is perfectly tamped. I've got a bed of coffee that's really level. And what I wanna do is try and put it into my machine without knocking it so that I break that beautiful bed and I get the most extraction that I can. So I'm gonna put it at a 45 degree angle, really carefully, up and across. And now, as I mentioned, I've got 19 grams of coffee. So the amount of coffee I want to get out is double that in a one to two ratio. So what that means is for every gram of coffee, which is 19 in this case, I wanna get out two milliliters or two grams of coffee liquid. Um, so that will give me 38 milliliters um, or 38 grams. Those two terms aren't necessarily entirely inter interchangeable, but based on testing, one gram of liquid coffee is one milliliter of liquid coffee. Um, if you don't think that's the case, try it. Um, so here we're gonna put a cup underneath and we're gonna start our extraction. And what we're looking for, which I'll bring, the, I'll bring the camera in a little bit closer so you can see the extraction a little bit better. So here we can see how the extraction goes. 
And what we're looking for is a consistency of runny honey. And you want to stop the shot if you haven't got a volumetric machine like this Bristol Pro, as soon as you start to see uh, like blonding. So it will come out in this sort of really thin, dark brown, like runny honey, viscous stream. And then as soon as you start to see it blonde, which is where it starts to go a little bit paler, you'll want to stop your shot. So here we can see my timer going up and we get up to the right volume of coffee in 23 seconds. So the time I'm actually looking for is 25 to 35 seconds. And speaking to Notes, the roastery, they've recommended to get around about between 27 and 29 seconds for this shot for it to be really, really nice and flavorful. So this shot, because it was a little bit quicker, it'll taste maybe a little bit sourer or maybe a little bit more sourness in the cup and it won't have extracted as much flavor from the coffee as maybe I'd like. Um, so the best way to think of it is there's, there's sort of three flavor stages of coffee. The first bit, which is very intense and quite sour. The next bit, which is its body. Um, and then the final bit, which is bitterness, water and caffeine. What you want is to balance the bitterness at the end, which is, which is present in all coffee, with the sweetness at the start. And well, with the sourness at the start. And that's how you get this sort of perfect sweet spot, is this balance between the two. So my shot went way too fast, or a little bit too fast. So here's the changes I'm gonna make. As I said at the start, if you have a coarser grind, the shot will go quicker. And if you have a finer grind, the shot will go slower. So my shot was too fast, so I wanna slow it down. All of this will be mentioned on every single Sage machine. So what I'm gonna do is take it two notches finer. I'm gonna knock out this coffee, give my basket a wipe. So I always have a ton of cloths. You'll see I've got cloths out out my ears, um, give it a wipe with a, with a dry cloth just so it's clean, put it back into here, and then I've made my changes. This is a really important bit. What I'm going to do is grind out coffee, and what this means is whenever the, whenever the burrs are any changed the distance between them at all, there's a bit of coffee that will come out that's the previous grind size. So what you want to do is grind it so that you've got consistent grind size throughout your entire pup. Otherwise, whenever you make changes, they won't be enacted in the cup. So you'll make a change, you'll get the wrong result, you'll make another change, you'll get the wrong result, and you'll keep hot scutching between what's wrong and wrong. So what you wanna do, which sounds a little bit wasteful, is to waste some coffee. And in the long run, you'll save a lot of coffee doing this. So what I'm gonna do is just grind it for about four or four seconds, get about eight grams of coffee. So not very much at all, just, just a little bit. Get rid of that, and then put it back in. I'm gonna wait for my clock to reset so that I'm actually grinding for 13 seconds. Then I'm gonna grind again. And the tap drop, so tapping here, what it does is just level out that bed and it means I don't get coffee over everywhere. There we go. So here we've got the same big pile of coffee. I'm gonna then tap it on the side again. Get out my tamper put it onto the top with my fingers to the edge, move it around, pushing as hard as I can, so you've got nice and level, and using my fingers on a surface, moving them around so I can feel that it's level. Once I've done this, I'm gonna use my razor tool to ensure that I've got enough coffee and to take off any excess. So you can see I've still got a little bit of excess, and I'll calibrate this at the end so I'm not wasting as much, but this is literally one, one or two grams of coffee right here. Shake that off, tamp it again just to make sure that it's all flat again, and then I'm going to put it in and we're going to see what effect that has on the flow, what effect that has on the flavor, but mostly what effect that has on the time. So what I'm looking for is to increase the time of my extraction. Move in a little bit closer, so you can see. Give this a wipe so it looks like I'm a professional. And then we're going to press extract. So here we can see it's pre-infusing. So all the machines will have a basic pre-infusion of around seven seconds. And you shouldn't see coffee come out in this time. If coffee's coming out in this period, it means you've got it way too coarse. So here we can see around about 11 seconds, I've got a really nice steady stream and you can see it flowing almost maybe too slowly, but we'll see how it goes at the end. So this was a change of literally just two settings on my machine and I've gone from a little bit too quick at 20 se 23 seconds up to a 30 second extraction. So I've exactly done what I wanted to do, which was change it from 23 to around, well, I said 27 to 29, but Believe me, this will be perfect. And I've got two really nice shots of coffee, both of which, one will be maybe a little bit more acidic than I'd like, but still entirely drinkable. And I'd still be really happy to drink this. And then I've got it a little bit sweeter, a little bit more balanced, a little bit more complex in terms of flavor. 
So that's dial in. To recap, we've got the grind size and the grind amount. Grind amount, we want to get 19 grams. And for the grind size, we want it to be a fineness. So I achieve 25 to 35 seconds. But this will be different for every single coffee I get. So that's dial in. And that's a process you should do whenever you get a new coffee or whenever you have major changes to your coffee. So the next bit, and probably the most popular, but for me and for the coffee community, so to put it in perspective, a lot of people get really frustrated at the dial-in process. I used to work in a coffee shop. We would run between 20 and maybe 30 shots of coffee in the morning to get that perfect dial-in. And obviously that was my job, and you were paying a lot more per cup. But whenever you go to the specialty coffee shops, that's the kind of work they put in to get that incredible flavor. Um, so don't be too worried. And remember that this coffee will still taste good, and it's just making those tiny iterative changes so that it gets from what is still a good coffee, like absolutely passable, to a little bit better until eventually you've got a great coffee. Some people call it a god shot, where it tastes exactly as the things say in the bag. So on the bag, it will give you all these tasting notes. You should be able to taste them if you're buying from really good coffee roasters, which we'll talk about a bit more at the end. But I'm going to knock this out, and we're going to talk about latte and latte art. So the first thing to mention is I will not, by the end of this class, promise you that you'll be able to do a heart or in fact any motif. The most important thing about latte art is practice. So I'm gonna show you everything I know and everything that will make it easy for you to improve. But as you'll see throughout this, all of it is about consistency and having replication and just doing the same thing over and over again until you get better at doing latte art. So to put it in perspective, Again, I used to work in a coffee shop. I would make between 300 and 500 cups of coffee every single day. And I would get to practice in each one of those instances. And obviously I, was, I, was pay I wasn't allowed to send out coffees that were bad. So this is my sort of curve, real, real steep curve of, of knowledge. If, you want to, if you're making one or two coffees a day, you need to make sure that every single small bit of your coffee making process from using cold milk, using a same jug that's clean, all of the little bits that you can put right so that they're consistent from cup to cup, you need to put in place. Otherwise, you'll not be able to get better at latte art and you'll have a real frustration trying to get there. But fortunately, it's not very hard to do most of the bits. So first bit is having the right amount of milk. I'm using full fat organic milk um, and I'm gonna put in four ounces of milk. So this will be roughly to the min line on my jug. Oh, sorry the min line on my jug. Um, the reason it's four ounces is milk will actually increase in volume by one third, or it, you're gonna increase it in volume by one third. So we want the right volume of milk. If you put way too much milk in, it means whenever you're pouring off, you'll pour thin milk and you'll never get to the thick bit. And if you've got too little, um, well, you won't have a full cup of coffee. So that will also be a little bit annoying. So what you want is the right amount of milk. In this case, we're gonna use four ounces, but this will match to your cup size. So I'm using exactly six ounce cups. Um, whatever cup size you use, so here's an example of one I made earlier, this is an 8 ounce cup. Um, there's also this cup over here, this will be a 7.7 .7 ounce cup. And you need to have a knowledge of what volume of milk you want at the end so that you can be able to pour latte art. It seems quite simple, it's similar to baking a cake. If you, <laughs> as before, if you don't know the size of your container and you just put in any old amount, you'll end up with either a pancake or just cake batter going everywhere. It's the same with milk. So try and figure out the right amount. I bought these, which are Picardy, the Duralux Picardies. Um, they're really nice and they're six ounces and you'll probably see them in a lot of sort of Australian antiquity and time coffee shops, super cheap. And I'd recommend for practice because they're all the same size and they cost about a pound a piece. So I'll be using those ones and then we'll get into steaming milk. So we're gonna do a little camera angle change so that you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. There we go. Fingers crossed. Every now and then it just falls off. So apologies if that happens. There you go. So now you can see my steam wand just here. I've got my jug with my milk in it. And what I'm going to do to start is steam off to purge. So what this is doing is just steaming some milk, blowing out any sort of old coffee, old milk, and making sure that the steam wand hot. You need to do that before every single time you steam milk. Next bit, I'm going to get, once I've purged my steam wand, which you can do on every single one of the machines. I'm gonna put it in. So here, I'm gonna put it into the spout. You can see, put it down the spout, off center and just off the side. So if you see here, it's, one sec. It's in the spout, 
just off center and just towards the edge. And what I'm trying to do is create this whirlpool in the middle. At the start, I want the tip of my steam wand just on the surface of the milk. And then once it's increased in volume by one third, I'll then put the steam wand further in and create this whirlpool and incorporate all that air. So the two processes I'll be doing are aeration or creating air bubbles. And then I'll be incorporating those air bubbles into a consistent microphone structure. So let's get started. So steam wand just onto the tip, down the spout, turn it on. I've then got my hand on this side. That's gonna keep my temperature. So as I mentioned before, I want to get to 55 degrees, which is too hot to touch. And then I wanna wait three further seconds to get it to 60 or 65 degrees. So here you can see, you can hear, you can see, and you can feel that I've, I'm creating bubbles. So you wanna hear the sound of ripping paper. Once you've created about one third of volume of air, I'm gonna put the steam wand in further. So it's still got this lovely vortex in my jug. And then I'm waiting for it to get to too hot to touch. And as soon as it gets too hot to touch, which is now, I'm gonna take my hand off, wait one, two, three, and turn it off. So now I might, might be able to see, I've got some bubbles in my jug, although you can't really see them, but I've got some bubbles in my jug. So what I'm gonna do is quite authoritatively give it a tap on the side and then swirl it around. So the two things you can do are tapping it, which knocks out bubbles and swirling it, which incorporates thick milk from the top into the, into the rest of my milk. Next, I'm gonna pour my lasse art. So here's, here's the bit I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for. But mostly I'm gonna swirl my coffee to make sure that it's all incorporated. I'm gonna swirl my milk to make sure it's all incorporated. And you wanna continually swirl it until you're ready to pour, until you're confident that you're, you're ready to pour. Swirl this around, swirl this around. I'm gonna put my cup at a 45 degree angle. I'm gonna pour from a height of three inches above the, or from a pretty much higher height. As soon as I get to a half full on my cup, I'm gonna go down really close, form a heart and flip. So let's, let's see that in practice. So pouring from a height, moving it around to create this sort of canvas, going down really close and flick. And there you can see a really, really nice heart. I would say pretty much exactly the same as the first copy I did. So top tips there, we'll go through again. I'll show you from a different angle so that you can see sort of what I'm doing whenever I'm steaming my milk. I'm gonna move it over, pick it up. Hopefully everyone can still see. And we're gonna go again on steaming my milk. A really important factor here is I'm gonna clean my jug. I'm gonna clean out all this old milk, which I've got hopefully not very much left over. In this case, I've got maybe too much. So what I'm gonna do is reduce the amount of milk I use. So what I've done is I've cleaned this out with cold water and I'm ready to go again. And I would always clean your jug in between uses. I know it may seem annoying, but I can promise you if you're making one coffee for you and one coffee for a loved one, and the coffee you make for yourself has a beautiful heart because it was the first one, and the coffee you make for your loved one is a really gross one, um, you probably won't have a great relationship from that point on. So what we're gonna do, we've got our jug, I'm gonna pour in enough milk, and then I'm gonna steam to purge. So this just, purges out any old leftover milk and also heats up my steam wand. So I'm just making sure there's some steam coming out. I'm then gonna put, bring my steam wand out, put it down the spout of the jug and just off center, as I showed you before, I'm using this hand here. I'm touching the side of my, my drip tray and I'm holding the side of my jug. And this means that I can use the same position on my jug every single time. And then turning on with the steam wand just on the surface of the milk, about halfway submerged, you want to hear this sort of intermittent pushing sound, like tearing paper. And I'm keeping my hand on the side throughout the entire process. As soon as I've increased the volume by about a third, which is usually when it starts to feel a little bit of warmth, I'm putting it in further so it then creates this whirlpool in the cup. I'm keeping my hand on the side in exactly the same position throughout with this whirlpool in the jug. As soon as it gets too hot to touch, which is in a second, which is now we ask one, two, three, and turn it off. And this milk should be exactly the same temperature as before and exactly the same thickness. So when I come to pour, I've got exactly the same, um, in, exactly the same cup of coffee at the end, which hopefully is what you're after. So here I've got my shot from before, which is getting a little bit old. So I'm gonna give it a swirl to make sure it's nice and incorporated. I'm swirling my jug and then you tap it on the side. One thing to note is don't, over tap it. So if you've got a ton of bubbles 
and it's really bad quality milk, I would throw it away and start again, unless you've got a very strong constitution and mental stability. Otherwise, you'll, you'll pour loads of really bad milk. So what I'm gonna do, I'm swirling around my jug until I'm ready to pour, swirling around my espresso until I'm ready to pour, and I'll show you from this angle. So what I'm gonna do is pour from a height, moving around, and then when I get to here, I'm just gonna go down really close and flicking. And there I've got exactly the same heart as I did on the first one and on the second one. So every single coffee I've poured today is the same. And hopefully every single coffee, if, if you give someone a heart in their coffee, they'll probably be really pleased with you. Um, so that's another thing I was, I'd really like to mention is a lot of people watch Instagram influencers and professionals in coffee shops. And as I said before, they'll be able to practice to such a high volume and they'll do very complicated techniques that aren't necessarily watchable to learn. So you can't simply watch what they're doing and copy it because a lot of it will be, it will be the, the consistency they've retained in their milk. They'll have larger volumes of cup. They'll do a lot of stuff that you won't know about to create that beautiful latte art that you see of like two swans kissing on a moonlit night. I would say once you get the heart down and you can do it consistently every single time, without a fail, that's when you want to step up to the next level of latte art, which is, I would say, go from hearts to tulips, which is where you do a blub, a blub, a blub, and then move forward. Then you go to rosettas, which is where you incorporate a wiggle. And then it's up to a combination of those. So a swan is just a wiggle, a line, and a heart, and then a line. It's, they're all just combinations of hearts, rosettas, and tulips, pretty much. There are some super complicated ones, but mostly it's just combinations of those. So baristas, everyone sort of thought baristas were like super smart when they did all this, but in reality, this is just how milk pours. So it would create a blob due to the, the fluid dynamics of the milk. And then all you're doing is pushing it through to create a heart. It's not as complicated as people think. And it's literally just how the milk will fall into your cup. So we've taught you dialing where you extract you change your grind size and your grind amount from 19 to 19 grams and then to get an extraction of 25 to 35 seconds depending on your taste and you want to put in 19 grams of coffee and get out around about 38 mils of coffee or in the case of the dual boiler systems you'll get 22 grams of coffee and 44 milliliters of coffee out so we then steam some milk with our steam wand into the spout purging first and then the tip of the wand just half into the surface of the milk we then put it in all the way and create a whirlpool in our jug until it's at 55 degrees. We wait three seconds and then we stop and we should have 60 to 65 degree milk. And then the pour, which is just pouring from a height with the cup at a 45 degree angle. Once the cup gets to halfway full, we go down really close to the surface, pour the same speed and you'll see a blob form and then it's just a real slow up and flick to create our heart. So those are the key takeaways from this lesson. Um, now. We're going to ask Tom if there's any things that you've asked in terms of questions that I can help with. Hello. Yeah, quite a few, actually. Um, so just a couple of ones. So we had somebody with a Brista, a Brista Pro, actually, um, and just wondering about being able to change or pop out the filter baskets. If there's a, if there's a particular trick you use, whether it's using two baskets, oh. using one or whatever. I've got just a trick for you, my friend. So all the tools I've got in front of me. Here's my, if you wanted to take out your basket, which is really good for cleaning, I use my razor. Ta-da! And there you can see, because I'm an amazing barista, I, I kept it clean, which you should do. So what you're looking for is, this is from the extraction just now. I just clean this every one, once a week and literally just get a cloth, not this one. Get a cloth, give it a wipe. If it's really dirty, use like a Brillo pad, which is fine, because it's all stainless steel, so it can take pretty hard punishment. Put it back in, good to go. So what you can use is a razor. Next question. Um, another one, just uh, whilst you're in front of the machine. Um, so one of them is is just talking. Uh, we've had quite a few queries just about um, kind of steam ones and over time. And if it's if it's you know you you're using a manual steam one, but if a, an automatic isn't quite producing what it what it used to, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a way to kind of clean it through? I get you. So. It will come with this cleaning tool, which a lot of people think is, I don't know, a sim removal tool. I wasn't actually entirely sure what it was for a while. What this is for is for on the little on the bottom of your steam one, there's these little holes. What you can do is obviously 
don't do this when it's really hot because because that's dumb uh, but i did so here you can see our our steam tip what we've got on there is a variety of different holes so what we're going to do is push down in to make sure they're clear we can also soak this in steam wand cleaner what i would do though is soak the entire body in either steam wand cleaner or just water so working in a coffee shop if you just soak your steam wand every day in water just whenever it's not in use just get put the steam wand back on get a jug of water which can actually be the milk jug just one sec i should put this back on um so i've cleaned this with my little oil tool um if it gets stuck it, the the machine does actually come with a wrench for it to pull off so feel free to use that um but what you can do is obviously clean this out so it's not full of milk um but you can then fill it back up with hot water or just cold water i'll show you now so fill this up with water and just steam it until it's until it makes a really horrible sound so turn this on and steam it and it'll it'll be really loud so you'll know it's kind of working and what this will do is just push out any any milk and clean your steam on uh, this is also the process you'll use with the steam on cleaner but you can just do it without water uh, with, with water and not with steam on cleaner and it works like still follow the regimen of cleaning like do it once a month or once every three months depending on your use of the machine but just put it up to boiling and then maybe leave it overnight and that will clean your steam wand and it will solve most issues so a lot of people will experience um change of pressure from their steam wand over time and that's just because they either haven't purged or they've left milk on this so you'll notice as soon as i finished steaming i gave it a wipe that's what you want to do because if you leave it even for any period of time this is a really hot steam wand and this is milk so it will it will thicken up and it will it will create this that this horrible burnt milk that will then incorporate into all of the drinks you do from then on so keeping your machine but especially your steam on clean is, is super super important and it's actually super easy as well thank you very much um and do, is there a particular reason as to why the coffee puck might stick to the shower screen and how would you stop that from happening for sure. So this question is kind of tricky for me because I've never had a puck that's stuck to my shower screen. So I can I can imagine why it would happen. So it will probably be because you're either using um, coffee that's not super fresh. So all this coffee, I'd recommend it being roasted within month, one month. Um, and then either using way too little coffee, way too much coffee, um, or you're way off in terms of your calibration. So a really wet puck is a pretty good sign that something's off. Although I can't tell you exactly what that something is because it could be any of the stuff I just mentioned. So as I would say, if, you're, if you've got a really wet puck or if the puck sticks, it's a sign that you're, you're too far off calibration. But I promise you, and please do type in the Q&A, if you followed the steps and you've got 19 grams of coffee in your basket, it's fresh within a month and you're extracting sort of 38 milliliters of, milk, of, of coffee, if it's still sticking after that period of time, let me know because I've never experienced it. And once you get to a good calibration on your machine, you won't experience it either. It just shows that maybe you've, there's a little bit of work to do to get the best out of your coffee. Thank you very much. And you mentioned there about coffee being roasted within a, in a certain amount of days and whatnot. Can you talk us through about kind of what to look for when, um, when kind of buying coffee? Please? So I'll show you this bag. Um, this is Notes Monte Cristo. So real important things to look for are where it's from. If, they, if the roaster can't tell you where the coffee came from, it's a bad sign right off the bat. Um, also look for having a variety. So the variety is just, there's, there's Arabica Robusta, um, there's then sub varietals underneath the genus of Arabica. Um, and if they know what those are, those are, it means that they have a knowledge of, of the farmer and of the various cultivars they're using on their farm. So if they know that, it's similar as if you've got like generic carrots or if you've got heritage carrots or heirloom carrots or a specific variety of carrots like Chantonix. And if you know that, it's probably a better sign that the farmer kind of knows what's going on. So that's a good thing to look for. Um, process, so I'm gonna talk about this more because it's th this one's a really interesting process. But the process is once they've picked all those coffee cherries, which grow on a tree, they, they then need to get the husk off that cherry. And there's a few ways of doing it. Mostly you either leave out in the sun or you wash it in a bunch of water. Um, if they know what that is, it also is a really good sign because it means they're not just buying volume of coffee, like coffee, Brazilian coffee in a volume. They're buying, I want that coffee because it tastes great. So look for that. And then it's down to a lot of people will know altitude, although I don't, I don't care. 
altitude too much. I think great coffees have been grown at low altitudes, great coffees have been grown at high altitude. It's usually more likely you'll get a great coffee at high altitude, but it's not a necessary fact, especially now with different varietals that can grow at different altitudes. Um, then you've got roasted on date, which I would say is probably the most important in that if a coffee's outside of one month, um, it's very unlikely that it will taste good. But there's one caveat for this, which very few roasters do. So on here, it says nitrogen flushed, um, which I don't want to bore you, but nitrogen is in inert. Um, and it means that the coffee won't oxidize because there's no oxygen. So what Notes does is they flush the bag with nitrogen. And it means that this coffee will stay as fresh as when roasted for up to 12 months with no distinguishable degradation. Um, I would love it. My old roastery used to do this and they didn't advertise it. But if you find a coffee that's been nitrogen flushed, it will last so much longer and be so much more consistent and delicious. And it just shows a level of care on the part of the roaster uh, to the product they're creating. So yeah, hopefully answer your question. Look for roast date, maybe varietal, definitely where it's from in terms of like the region. Um, and then just look for once you get really into it and you sort of develop your palate and you can taste different differences, um, look for the, the processing method. Thank you. And is that what you'd refer to as, as a kind of third wave or speciality? Thanks for asking. So th this is the last bit, essentially, of this class, which is trying to teach you about what is third wave speciality. So we put on all of our marketing material and on all the machines that you can achieve third wave speciality coffee at home. And a lot of people seem to either not understand what those terms mean um, or they don't understand how that interacts with them. So I'm gonna explain what those terms mean and why they are super important, especially in the current climate. So first, the first phrase we'll go through is speciality. So as I mentioned or alluded to before, there's two different main genuses of coffee. There's actually about four or five, but the main ones cultivated are uh, Arabica, which is 70% of global production, and Robusta, which is 30% of global production. Um, I'm not gonna talk about Robusta too much. Essentially, uh, for me, it tastes really bad. I don't like the taste of it. It's used in Italian blends. It gives huge body. Um, you can get okay Robusta, but in my, in my experience in the coffee industry, I've never cupped Robusta that wasn't instantly distinguishable as bad uh, and instantly distinguishable as Robusta. <laughs> um, it's, its potential for flavor is, is quite weak at current. There's a, there's a chance that it can be sort of, it, it can be evolved into subspecies that taste good. But right now, the speciality scale is in relation to Arabica. So always purchase Arabica coffee, I would, unless you love the taste of Robusta, in which case, more power to you. It's, it's a cheaper way to make coffee because one, it's really cheap and you, you, can, you can use very small grammage to get a really punchy flavor. Um, but mostly I'll talk about Arabica. So Arabica is, is, is cupped. So that's where you can set up all these cups. It's done in the country of origin. It's sometimes done in transit. And then it's done as soon as it hits the roaster or it's en route to the roaster. And it's, a, it's where they put the coffee into a cup and there, there's people called Q graders who can taste every flavor in the coffee, but also can note things like defects in the beans, issues with the processing method, and all these, like a huge multitude of qualitative differences between the, between the coffees, and they'll give it a score. Um, and that's obviously super important for just for general quality scale in the it's really nice to be able to know that this is a really high quality of coffee. So similar to like beef, where you get different grades of beef and it'll go up to like Wagyu, which has a certain level of striation in the meat. The same with coffee, anything above 80, speciality. So it's super simple scale, um, easy to understand. And it, the, I guess the, one of the more important things for me and for the people who grew this in Brazil, uh, it means that they get to sell it at a speciality price. So the two main ways that you sell coffee at current are either commodity traded, where a broker or some sort of trader will go to a coffee plantation or go to, a, to a, just a massive warehouse full of coffee and they'll purchase it at commodity price. And that's the price, trade on the stock exchange. And that would be all fine if the stock exchange worked um, that had an idea of the cost of living for a, ro for, a, for a grower. But in reality, the commodity price of coffee is far below the living rate, like the living wage of most coffee producing nations, um, which are already really poor nations. So the fact that commodity traded coffee further disadvantages 
coffee producing nations, I think is something that most people wouldn't want to endorse. I think the more people understand about it, the less likely they would be to buy commodity traded coffee because it, it's, in, it's endorsing something that's not necessarily good. And I think in a lot of walks of life, you wouldn't do the same in, in different ways of, of purchasing goods. And the more you sort of educate yourself on wh where stuff comes from and, and how it came about, the more likely it is you'll want to pay the people who made it maybe a little bit more. Um, so the next is obviously speciality where the, it's a far nicer working relationship where the farmer, in this case, the, the Terra farm in Brazil will say, and they'll be in contact with notes and they'll say, you know, like what flavors do your customers love? What kind of quality you're looking for? Like maybe even do you want to try out a different variety or plant? We can plant it for you. Which terroir do you prefer? They'll then either listen to those or create a product they think is exceptional um, and cups really well. Like for example, the Terra, their farm really consistently creates the best coffee in Brazil. Like without, I would say without a doubt. Um, and it means they can then go to, to Fabio at Notes and they can say, hey, like I've created this wonderful product, this product that has everything you requested and everything your customer wants. And I want this price for it. And then they can say like, yeah, we have a market for this product and we can definitely charge a, a premium because this could be the best coffee. I, I think this is one of the best coffees in Brazil this year. And they can charge it such. And the, I guess the great thing for you, the coffee consumer, is um, the cost per cup from the cheapest coffee to the most to the most expensive, which this definitely isn't by the way, it's like 10 pound a bag, um, is about three or four pence. And I think if I asked you the question in a coffee shop, and I think if more coffee shops put this forward, that you can either purchase a coffee where you're essentially in, endorsing what would be modern slavery, um, or you can pay them a fair wage so they can reinvest in agriculture, into education, medical practices, um, and, the, and the difference to you is three or four pence. Um, I really hope everyone watching would make, make one of, what, a pretty obvious decision. Um, and I, that's, the, that's the great thing, that's the great power you have, is that you can make those sort of buying decisions um, with minimal cost, but with, with not that big an imp impact on your pocketbook. So the next one is third wave, and third wave is exactly what I've been talking about before. But it's a phrase, I'm not, I don't super love the term third wave. I don't think anyone in the coffee industry does. But what it, what it refers to is the first wave was instant coffee, where coffee was purchased from, let's say, continental Africa, as in every nation in Africa. They would just get coffee. They would instantize it seasonally as the seasonal crops came, in, came about. And they create a product that never goes off. And you put two scoops in a cup and you'll get coffee every single time. And you might not be able to give it flavor notes outside of wood, cocoa, yeah, about wood and cocoa, maybe some nuts in there. And it will be the same every time, which is kind of nice. Um, that happened around the sort of 40s and 50s. It then transitioned into sort of the Starbucks and the Costas of this world where, yeah, they, they, they know where the coffee comes from. Um, it's usually aggregated, like a bunch of coffees are put together to make this blend that's consistent again every single time. And they're using a slight innovations in technology like espresso machines to create pretty good consistency. So they did a great job in creating consistent coffee and they made the market we sort of play in now. And that could also be referred to in sort of supermarkets. So if you look in supermarkets, you'll probably see, although England is kind of blessed in this regard, but you'll probably see a bunch of bags of coffee that will say like Colombia. Um, if anyone looks on a map, Colombia is really big. Um, similarly, Africa, uh, which is even bigger, um, or it'll just say like Asia. And that's sort of, I would call it aggregated commodity. Well, they'll purchase and trade it at market rate, which is sort of the only way that commodity trading can work. And then you get up to third wave where the coffee shops, you can actually go to notes if you're ever in London. I, I would. They're incredible once, once everything's back open. Um, but the, the barista there will be trained. They'll have a full knowledge of where the coffee came from. They'll understand the farming practices. They'll have dialed it in and they'll put in the effort that you've just gone through now to create incredible coffee. But they'll have done that for you. So you, you don't waste a little bit of coffee trying to get the best one. They'll have done that for you. And they'll be able to really confidently tell you like, oh, you're going to taste in this cup like a delicious big cherry body sweetness. Um, like on this one, it says it tastes like praline and milk chocolate in the cup. And it absolutely does. And it means they can say with confidence, like the, the farmer, the terror has put in this. They made these choices when growing coffee. Um, and then we picked it based upon these decisions. We roasted it to this exact level, and now we can offer it to you and serve it to you in our coffee shop. And you can have that exact experience that we wanted you to have and that the farmer wanted you to have. And everyone 
a tra on transparency across that entire chain so that the farmer had an intention for you to drink a beautiful cup of coffee and it was fulfilled by every step along the way. Um, fortunately, now there's the ability to do that at home. So I would say third or fourth wave would be the ability to have that wonderful experience, learn the art and the artisan and that, that sort of master that moment of creating amazing coffee where you you sort of get guidance from notes or from sage and they tell you how to make incredible coffee and you can experience that exact same thing but instead of having to travel maybe 100 miles to a coffee shop that can actually make great coffee you can do it at home and you can sit on your sort of veranda and have that wonderful moment um, and i think I, I used to have a boss who was a world barista judge and he used to ask one barista a day to make him a coffee and he just wouldn't drink it if it wasn't good enough because he knows that I only drink about one or two cups of coffee a day. I'm not going to drink a bad cup of coffee. There's no, it's not worth it. So if you, tr if you start thinking like that and it, you'll have a far nicer life, um, but also try and expand that into other, other methods of food production and stuff like that. So that's third wave and that's speciality. Um, I would, so this is Monte Cristo. I'll tell you a little bit about this one because I, I really love it, uh, which is the reason why I didn't actually get a discount when I purchased this because I just really, really want to try it so uh at notes they've this is from brazil which is the biggest coffee producing nation um it's from a farm called the terra it uses a new varietal which is um iac 125 essentially it's like uh they splice together various of the incredible features of different uh varietals of coffee to create a plant that's well sort of it leaf rust resistant, but also really good in terms of the quality of the flavors that it puts across. Um, and then they've the processing method. So I mentioned at the start, there's two methods of processing in coffee. So there's either washed where they put it, they brush it through water and they take off that coffee cherry or dry, like called natural where, or natural pulp, where they'll either run it through a hull, like a miller to break the skin and then leave out on beds. Um, and the sun will take away that coffee cherry and you'll be left again with your green coffee that you, you then roast or send to, send to the roaster to roast. This one is really interesting. So it's called dried on the tree. And it used to be that this was a, this method of coffee, this wasn't really considered a method of coffee production really. Um, mostly because usually the ones that were left on the tree were ones that were never picked or they missed their, but the, the team at the Terra have such a innate understanding of their plants and the, and the way at which the coffee grows that they'll pick them at exact perfect not just ripeness but they've actually dried on the tree so that they've lost their moisture content and got to the appropriate moisture content that they'll pick them at that time and it shows a level of care and sort of uh, plant i think it's plant husbandry that's exceptional like it's it's shocking the level of care and the amount of man hours that goes into coffee from the farmer um and for this one especially so if anyone wants uh, head over to notes coffee and you can get a 25% discount on all of their coffees using the code SAGE MASTERCLASS. Um, and it's incredible. I can't, I can't recommend it enough. I bought some El Tambo Espresso. I also bought some for Filter. And I'm actually really excited to try them all. Um, no, no lies. So, so yeah, definitely check out Notes. But mostly just check out any roaster that can talk to you coherently about their coffee. And obviously, you should be able to talk to them really coherently, thanks to the machine. So all the, the amazing thing about Sage machines is that they adhere to exactly the same parameters that Notes will have on their in the commercial machines in their coffee shops. So when you say, like, it's nine bars of pressure, it's 93 degrees of temperature, they can say to you, like, oh, well, this coffee is, I don't know, like a Kenyan coffee, and it's a little bit lighter roasted. So maybe take the temperature down to 92. And most machines won't be able to do that, or they'll be fluctuating up and down loads. But our machines can. And it means you can have that direct dialogue. And I honestly would. And if, if you talk to a roaster and they can't tell you how to dial in their coffee, don't buy from them anymore. I can't stress that enough. If, if the roaster that you buy coffee from doesn't know how, the, how to make it taste good, uh, don't buy them. <laughs> like, just don't buy it from them. Um, and if they can, which I know notes can, but just reach out to them. And they'll, they'll be able to help you dial in. They'll be able to tell you the best sort of um, recipe for the coffee. And most importantly, it should, it should force them to, to meet you where you are, which is making home espresso, and just force them to, force them to help you. Um, so yeah, that's everything about third wave and speciality. Um, Tom, any questions that I can help people with? 
Um, so we've still got about 50 odd questions uh, outstanding. So I do apologize as we're, we're not going to be able to get to everyone. Um, but there has there's one topic that's, that's come up probably about 10 times in various different ways. Um, so it's asking about a lot of people asking about the plastic insert that, are, that there is in some of the <laughs> okay, filters, really? but not all of them. <laughs> What's it for? Is it necessary? Is it, is it OK to remove it? it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, so uh, this this one's on me. I hope no one from Sage is watching. So I showed you my basket and it obviously doesn't have the plastic insert. Um, the plastic insert, you should keep it in if you're going to split your, so if you're making a double shot and it's going into two cups, keep that insert in because it will regulate the flow so it pours out evenly from both of your porter filters. I always drink a double shot, so I don't need it. So I just took it out with um, with a metal stick. Uh, but yeah, you can totally take it out. And what it means is you'll be able to see really easily whether your water filter is dirty. So yeah, feel free to take that into it out if you're not looking to split your shots. Um, but in reality, it has no effect on flavor. Um, the only effect on flavor it could have is if you let oils build up underneath it. Um, but you can just quite simply like soak the water filter if you don't want to take it out. Thank you. I think that that definitely answers that one. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I did that today, so I feel a bit guilty now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, any other any other questions I can help with while I'm, while I'm here? Um, yeah, we I mean, we have a lot, a few people asking about kind of soya milk and oatly, um, oat, just dairy alternatives, really, and kind of temperatures. And also, you, you know, a lot of people asking about the automatic uh, steam ones and how yeah. they'd get the same texture as what you had. Absolutely. So first, I'll show you an alternative milk copy. So alternative milk is pretty close to me because I, although you saw me just sipping a copy there, I actually don't drink milk most of the time, um, but I don't want to put it to waste. So I'm going to make a coffee real quick. Hopefully this will also recap a bunch of stuff. So grind this, tapping it throughout. I'm then going to get my milk. In this case, I'm using minor figures. Um, it's obviously, this isn't a paid endorsement by minor figures. Essentially, just use any alternative milk that says it's barista style. So if, you, if you've ever seen a cow and then you've seen an uh, almond tree, the two are very different in terms of their biology. Um, and obviously almonds are not meant to feed baby cows. Similarly, milk is not meant to uh, populate uh, and further the lifetime of trees. So the content of an almond or an oat or of soya beans is very different to milk. And all the all machines were made to do milk. They weren't made to do all milks. So you want to find a milk that's a barista style milk. Um, so this one says foamable. It's also this one's really specifically for baristas, which is why it has a slightly higher price point. They're also doing a really cool initiative right now where you can buy a buy a case, get a 30% discount, and you get a bag of coffee with it, which is kind of cool. So definitely check out minor figures, but feel free to use Oatly, um, Outpro, Barista Style, and a bunch of others, which are all pretty much just as good. Um, so then I've got my coffee, give it a tap just to level it out, tamp with my fingers to the edge as hard as I can. I'm then going to use my razor tool to cut off any excess. Tamp again, just to make sure that it's flat after razoring. Put this in, grab my cup and start extracting. And now, so, while this is extracting, I'll explain a little bit further. So alternative milk and regular milk, they should, as long as you've got a Bristol, Bristol style one, they should extract exactly the same, or they should um, steam exactly the same. I'm gonna do exactly the same things. I wanna increase this volume by about a third. Um, I wanna put in the right amount, which is about four ounces. Um, I wanna steam it, and this is the only difference. I wanna steam it until it's 55 degrees. So on the other ones, I went until it's too hot to touch, 55 and then I waited three seconds. I'm gonna do exactly the same stuff, but I'm not gonna wait. I'm just gonna turn it off as soon as it's too hot to touch. So I'll show you the steam on, down the spout, and just off center, and then the tip just in the top. And then, one, it loves to sound like tearing paper, and I wanna create a whirlpool in the jug. And then as soon as it increases in volume by about a third, I'm just gonna wait and put the steam wand in a little bit further, keep my hand on the side, and then as soon as it's too hot to touch, which is now, we'll turn it off. So super simple and exactly the same technique. And there, 
you can see I've got exactly the same. It looks, I'll show you. It looks exactly the same as the milk from before. Um, and that's because they made it to be exactly the same as the milk, as normal milk. So here I've got a wonderfully extracted shot, which I'm going to keep swirling around. I've got my perfectly steamed milk. I'm going to do exactly the same process again. So what I'm going to do, swirling everything and tapping if I've got bubbles, and then pouring from a height, moving it around. And then when I get to around about halfway full, I go down really close and flick forward. And there you can see, once again, I've got exactly the same heart as I did on all the other cups. Um, so it should be exactly the same technique. Um, but to your, in answer to your question for um, automatic machines, they'll, I'll, I'll reel off the settings to get exactly the same mat as, as I've manually foamed here. So if you've got the Bambino, you want to steam it to froth setting one and heat setting two. And then if you're using alternative milks, you want to put on heat setting one and froth setting two. And then if you're on the Oracle Touch, no, on the Barista Touch, sorry, you're going to want to steam it to 55 degrees and froth setting four if you're using alternative milks. And then 65 degrees and froth setting four if you're using regular milk. And then for the Oracle and Oracle Touch, you want it on froth setting four and 62 degrees for regular milk. And then 57 degrees and froth setting four for alternative milks. And that should give you exactly the same thickness of foam and that's really what it defines so these are all done I, used to, I entered some competitions back when i was younger um and what you want is a flat white is just one centimeter of foam in a six ounce cup with two ounces of coffee and the rest is milk so if you want that do that but if you like it a little bit frothier add more froth to your thing and similarly if you're using a manual system just add more air and it'll be a it'll be a thicker consistency but you should still be able to use exactly the same technique for exactly the same latte so hope that answers your question Thank you very much. And uh, I think we've we've just about reached reached time, unfortunately. Um, even we, we do have uh, th over yeah, about still about 30, 40 questions. But we just <laughs> I wish we could stay, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not possible. So no. So I guess to wrap up, um, there's some really cool things that Sage Blinds is is planning to do. So I'd keep an eye out if you have a chance. Follow the Eventbrite page. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on YouTube and sign up to our newsletter. So if you go onto our website, sagecliences.co.uk, you can sign up to our newsletter and we'll send out updates because we've got some really cool um, projects coming out. So we're hoping to work directly with some roasters so you can potentially buy a bag of coffee and then you'll dial it in along with me. Um, but also we'll update you about all sorts of new products we're releasing, deals on our website, um, and also just the free stuff that we're doing. So like, if you want to see, we're trying to do more latte art classes, alternative milk classes, and feel free to reach out. So on this, my email address is actually put out, which is Luke Powell, luke.powell at sageappliances.co.uk. Feel free to email me with any questions, queries, and I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, cause honestly, like I'm, I'm currently, I'm currently working from home and, and I, I and Sage with me really wants to help you make better coffee at home in whatever way we can. So if there's more content we need to produce to help you get there, let me know. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for watching. And hopefully this has helped you make some really, really nice coffee at home. Thanks very much and have a great long weekend.